Your presenters today are Lynn Markham and Jen McNelly. Uh, Lynn is a land use specialist with Clue. She, Lynn focuses on land use tools and techniques to project protect drinking water, lakes, and streams. To assist communities, Lynn provides research-based information, policy options, and community case studies. Lynn Jen McNelly is an extension groundwater educator for Central Wisconsin. Jen's work focuses on helping communities to better understand their groundwater resources and address groundwater quality and quantity concerns. And Lynn is ready to begin. All right, thank you, Karen. Um, thank you for joining us today for this noontime session. Um, during this session, we're going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of zoning as a tool to protect groundwater. Um, that'll include wellhead protection ordinances, zoning options for high nitrogen uses and other potential groundwater contaminants, um, and minimum lot sizes for homes on septic systems. So really, we're going a little bit broader than zoning, um, but you don't want a webinar title that's three lines long. So we will talk about comprehensive planning, different components of zoning, and subdivision ordinances, and how they can all be used um, to protect groundwater quality. So we'll get started. Um, we are going to start with a poll, actually two polls. Um, Becky's going to launch them, if you could each respond to them. Um, the first is, what is your role related to groundwater? Are you an elected official? Are you planning and zoning staff? Serve on a plan commission or board of adjustment, board of appeals? Are you a clerk or local government administrator? Are you an interested citizen? Are you something else? Um, and then also, if you could let us know how many people are watching from your site so that we know how many people we have all together on this. Looks like people are still entering their information, so we'll give it just a minute. All right. Oh. Okay. So in terms of results, we've got a few elected officials, a number of planning and zoning staff, um, and a number of other people. Um, most people have one person at their site, but we've got a few with three as well, which is great because then you can have a little bit of discussion during or afterward. So thank you. All right, so let's get started. Um, our overall message today is what we do on the land, our land use choices affect water quality. Um, everything is connected. Any contaminant that is spilled or applied to the ground um, can seep down and eventually end up in the water table. Some do that easier than others, depending on how well they dissolve in water. Um, so a couple of broad ways to reduce contaminants in groundwater are to redu reduce the sources of contaminants. If there are fewer of those chemicals around, they're less likely to end up in groundwater. And the second is to geographically separate, to spread them apart, have some distance between potential sources of contaminants and drinking water wells. And that can go either way. It's where you put the wells and it's where you put um, those potential sources. Um, you can see some of the um, possibilities that might affect groundwater potential sources are livestock waste storage pits, irrigation systems, pesticide and fertilizer applications to fields, golf courses, lawns, um, a landfill, storage tanks, which could be gasoline or some other kind of petroleum or almost any kind of chemical. Um, and then here's our gas station here and unsewered subdivisions. So subdivisions on septic systems. So those are kind of the things we're looking at. Um, and I'm going to start with our key takeaway because I want to just get straight to the point and then we'll explain the details. Um, land use decisions affect groundwater quality and over 95% of our communities in Wisconsin, their groundwater is their only source of drinking water. 
um, plans, community plans, zoning ordinances, and subdivision ordinances are all tools that can be used to protect groundwater. On the weaknesses side, zoning has limited ability to address existing land uses, things that have already been built on the landscape. Um, zoning also doesn't determine which crops are grown in agricultural districts, even though as we'll show, um, different crops have very different amounts of nitrogen leaching and probably also pesticide leaching to the groundwater. On the strength side, um, zoning can address and can be quite effective in addressing where new land uses are allowed and cited, where they're located and where they're not allowed. You know, if there's a, a land use that you don't want close to a municipal well, you can say that in your zoning ordinance. Um, wellhead protection zoning, this is zoning specific to ride around a community well that might be a municipal well or a different well that serves a group of people. Um, can protect the water quality in those wells. Zoning can list land uses that have the potential to pollute groundwater as prohibited uses, they're not allowed, or as conditional uses and include in the ordinance measurable standards that have to be met for them to be located in that place. Land uses that protect groundwater, we'll go through a list of those, um, can be encouraged through zoning and certainly through incentives as well, including local markets. And guiding residential development with septic system, guiding residential development new homes to either sewered areas where septic systems aren't an issue, or if they're going to be on septic systems, then spreading them out um, on lot sizes of two acres or more. So those are the main topics we'll be talking about today. Okay, so our outline, why protect groundwater quality, and then we'll go through the tools, comp plans, wellhead protection zoning, general zoning, subdivision ordinances, and then a wrap up. Okay, so why protect groundwater quality? Um, these are really the two biggies. Um, health, we want to protect people's health. We want them to have safe drinking water, something we all drink every day. Um, and it can be very expensive to clean up groundwater contamination um, on a small scale or on a large scale. It gets expensive and we'll talk about the specifics of that. Um, and then a third thing that I want to add is protecting groundwater quality can also reduce stress. Um, if people stay healthy, we're not worried about people getting sick from their drinking water, and local governments don't have to be involved in groundwater cleanups. That's less stress for everyone. Okay, so we're going to start with nitrate. This is our most common groundwater contaminant in Wisconsin, and this information is from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Um, for many years, we've talked about how nitrate can cause blue baby syndrome, where babies don't get enough oxygen because of nitrate and nitrite exposure. Um, similarly, we know that nitrate may cause birth defects. So this would affect women who are currently pregnant or may become pregnant in the next few years. Um, we know that the level of nitrate nitrogen over 10 milligrams per liter or 10 parts per million, that's where it can be harmful. Um, in more recent years, in the last decade or two, we've also learned that nitrate can cause thyroid disease. So this can affect people of all ages and nitrate may increase the risk of certain kinds of cancer. Um, so those are all issues to consider in terms of health. Um, in addition, nitrate acts as an indicator. It's easy to test for. And if your nitrate level is high, if it's over 10 milligrams per liter, then we know from looking at lots of data that your water is also more likely co to contain pesticides. If we look at nitrate statewide, this is the percentage of private wells that are over the 10 parts per million. 
dark blue is the lowest um, and then it goes through green and yellow and up to orange and red are the highest exceedance levels. Um, so you can see the north part of the state is mostly dark blue, doesn't have nitrate issues, and it's the central and southern parts of the state that have higher levels, minus along some of the Lake Michigan coast. Um, in Wisconsin, applying fertilizer and manure on ag fields accounts for 90% of the nitrate in groundwater. That's not to say in specific locations that there can't be other contributions. We know that drinking water is three times more likely to exceed the nitrate standard in ag areas compared to forested areas. More fertilizer applied. Um, and high nitrate levels are also more common in sandy soils. Um, it filters nitrate and other contaminants out to a lesser extent. Um, in terms of costs, what does it cost to replace wells or install nitrate removal equipment? Um, for municipal wells in Wisconsin, over $40 million has been spent on this. And you can see some small communities um, in central and central western Wisconsin, each spent about a million dollars a piece to deal with high nitrate levels. Um, if we look at private wells, we've got over 42,000 wells in Wisconsin that exceed the standard for nitrate. About 9 million has been spent so far to replace wells, and it's estimated that it would take 446 million to replace all private wells that are over the health standard. Um, in the statewide Groundwater Coordinating Council report, there is county data available in terms of projected costs to replace wells per county. Um, let's look at other groundwater contaminants. Nitrate isn't the only thing. Um, so this is based on a study from 2022 by the Department of Ag looking at three counties and the groundwater. You can see that corn has the highest percentage of wells um, that have a detect in it. Um, and then we get to the corn herbicide metabolites. So these are the weed killers. And we know that corn is our number one crop in Wisconsin in terms of acreage grown on 4 million acres. So it's probably not too surprising that we find the herbicides. Um, neonic insecticides are a type of insecticide that's often applied to the seed that's planted for corn and soybeans as well as these neonics can be sprayed on crops. And we're also finding those in groundwater. Other contaminants that we have standards for in Wisconsin, we've got standards for 130 chemicals. Benzene is known to cause cancer and is found in gasoline. Um, chlorinated solvents, these are solvents used at like auto shops or other metalworking places. You've probably heard about PFAS in the news. Um, some other ones that are found are arsenic, pharmaceuticals, and bacteria and viruses. I want to introduce the precautionary principle that's used in some areas when thinking about chemicals that are used in fields or other locations. Um, it says, if a product in action or a policy has a su suspected risk of causing harm to the public or to the environment, protective action should be taken even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established scientifically. So in other words, if we have a chemical and some initial studies done that suggests that it may cause negative health impacts, um, it's waiting until we know whether it causes health impacts or not before we spread it all over the landscape or use it in industry. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into the tools. Um, we're gonna start with the comprehensive plan or other community plans. This is our guiding document. It's not a regulation, but it says, what do we want the future of our community to look like? In 20 years, what do we wanna keep the same? What do we wanna change? Where do we want new development to happen? And what types of new development go where? Um, some of the regulatory tools to implement that comp plan are the zoning ordinance and the subdivision ordinance. And we'll jump into each of those in a little bit of detail. Um, so an initial question is what does your community's comprehensive plan say about drinking water, um, about the quality of drinking water 
and the policies in place to protect it. Um, something to check into. A few steps for integrating groundwater information into your comp plan. Um, inventory what groundwater data you have. Look for trends. You know, are you seeing certain pollutants going up and down? Are there certain areas where you're seeing issues? Then you want to have groundwater goals, objectives, and policies. You want to prioritize those policies. You can't do everything at once and then decide how to monitor progress. How often are you gonna monitor progress? Where are you gonna report out on that progress? Um, so just a few tips, provide specific recommendations about how to maintain or improve water quality. That's more helpful than vague, will protect water quality somehow. Um, some options are to update your zoning ordinance and your subdivision ordinance as well as to locate new homes or new businesses on wells in areas with safe drinking water. Um, most comprehensive plans have a future land use map. And on that land use map, I think it's key to show which way the groundwater flows. So you know if you locate a certain land use in this location, who's down gradient of it, who might be affected by that. Okay, and now I'm gonna hand it off to Jen for more detail on this. Sure. So I wanted to take a minute to talk about um, some examples of county level planning. Uh, so prior to me joining UW Extension, I was the water resource specialist for Portage County for nine years um, in central Wisconsin. And so some of the most of the examples that you're going to see today kind of deal with Portage County's um, groundwater policies or the tools that they had in place, but I will give examples from other communities. So the first one that Lynn had talked about was the comprehensive plan. Um, and this, is, like Lynn said, is just a great overarching document that really talks about the future goals um, and where you want your county to be headed. This is an excellent place to talk about uh, groundwater quality and quantity or drinking water related issues and that it really relates to every different chapter of a comprehensive plan. You know, water is that universal thing um, that really affects economics in our county, development, um, and it, so it really overarches all of the different chapters. So Portage County is one of the counties that includes groundwater um, into its county comprehensive plan. You can see there it's listed into the objectives to monitor and manage the effects of high capacity wells, land use, and private on-site waste disposal systems and solid waste disposal on the quantity and quality um, of groundwater in the county. This one doesn't get into specific policies per se related to groundwater in the comprehensive plan because Portage County is a little bit unique and that they also have a groundwater management plan, which is an entirely separate plan that deals strictly with the management of groundwater and drinking water sources in the county. And that entire plan is actually folded into the county comprehensive plan as a separate chapter. Um, so this one is a little bit more vague um, in the kind of the, just the general discussion because it has an entire chapter that that's focused specifically um, on groundwater. Lynn, if you wanna to go to the next slide. <clears throat> so there are two additional plans um, that I wanna talk about when we're talking about planning. To me, planning is one of the most important tools that a county or a community could really use to discuss groundwater. It's an opportunity for multiple different groups of people or viewpoints to come together and have these tougher discussions and to kind of lay out a plan of action for the future. And so sometimes in those discussions, it can take away some of the really, or it's a place to have the really difficult discussions um, that can sometimes come along with discussing groundwater or drinking water um, in these cases. So like I say, Portage County had its own specific groundwater management plan, which I'll go into in a little bit of detail um, in, in the next slide. But I do want to touch on that every county in the state of Wisconsin is required by state statute to have a land and water resource management plan. This is an excellent place to be talking about groundwater. If you wanted to keep your comprehensive plan a little bit more broad scope um, in nature, this land and water resource management plan specifically deals with kind of the land and water resources of a county 
and how they're managed. And so it really makes sense that groundwater is a part um, of this plan for, mo for those communities that are interested. And this is a county level plan um, for, for most counties. Um, and so just, it's a great tool. You don't necessarily need a separate groundwater management plan. I, I sometimes get that asked that question. Your land and water resource management plan can accomplish the same thing um, that a groundwater management plan would uh, in most cases. So an excellent tool tackled in a variety of different ways. Um, there are a whole slew of resources out there that can help you learn about your groundwater to include in these plans for background information. Um, and those include things like the Wisconsin Geologic and Natural History Survey, the US Geological Survey, Department of Natural Resources, all sorts of different things um, that are out there that have information and resources available. So, Lynn. So I just wanted to kind of give a snapshot of what um, a groundwater management plan might look like. So Portage County has one. These are relatively unique um, in the state of Wisconsin. Marathon County has a countywide groundwater management plan as well. I didn't pull examples from theirs because they're in the process of updating it um, <laughs> right now. So theirs is kind of in flux but very similar to any other type of planning effort that you'll see out there. So it has goals, objectives and actions. And then trying to keep with kind of some of those, you know, outlining who can be involved in this or who can help with those specific actions, a tentative timeline for how to accomplish those evaluation tools to make sure are we meeting the intended action that's out there and then potential funding sources, which is always usually the biggest hurdle um, in most of these cases. So pretty simple um, and a pretty basic planning design but specifically aimed at planning and having um, management plans in place for groundwater and drinking water in this particular case. Um, Cordage County has the, had this particular plan in place since 1988. Um, it is drafted by a subcommittee, <clears throat> excuse me, by a subcommittee comprised of citizens that represent every municipality in the county to ensure that all the voices are at the table. And then there's also a technical advisory committee that as well that reviews this, but it is adopted by the entire county board. Um, and then, like I said, included in the comprehensive plan. So the intent of this plan right here is really to outline the management activities related to groundwater uh, and drinking water for the county. It's intended to be updated every five years, um, but again, it's not a state required, a state requirement. And so the timeline can be a little bit flexible there for, for most communities. Okay. Oh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is that this is a great place to put in different types of tools um, that can be used by communities. It's not just a place to put information about drinking water or groundwater, um, but also to highlight some of the tools. One of the biggest ones um, that I think is super important for communities that we're, we're starting to develop across the state or sea is um, nitrate risk maps. Um, Rock County has been doing this for years. There's a number of, a number of other counties that are in the process of creating these. Um, and this is a tool that can be used to help support the planning decisions uh, that are put into a plan. And so this nitrate risk map, what it does is it overlays the different types of land uses, the geology of the area, soil drainage, um, nitrate test values as well, and then calculates a risk factor for each parcel within the county. That doesn't necessarily mean that that parcel, if it shows up in red as a high risk, has a high nitrate value. It's just saying that all the pieces or ingredients are there to potentially have that parcel of land have a high nitrate value. This can be really helpful uh, for decision makers or managers in each of the counties because it can be used to help target efforts. If there's limiting funding available, um, they may go after those high risk areas first or if there's areas of really good water quality, that might be an opportunity to protect those areas that have good water quality. So to, using tools like this in the planning process can also be super helpful in determining what actions um, might be appropriate for your counties. Okay, Lynn? Oh, you're muted, Lynn. 
thank you. Yep. Um, thanks for the, the overview of comp plans and other groundwater management plans. Um, now we'll look at how plans can be translated into zoning. So shown on the left is an example zoning map. Um, zoning regulates the location, size, and intensity of different types of development within a community. It has to be consistent with your comp plan, not the opposite of what your comp plan shows. And it's a proactive way to determine your community's future. Um, general zoning covers the entire local government area or jurisdiction. Um, and wellhead protection zoning is different. It doesn't cover the entire area. Instead, it's an overlay, an additional layer that covers land within the wellhead recharge area, the land area that contributes water to a community well. Um, all types of zoning has two parts, whether it's general zoning or wellhead protection zoning. Um, the first is a map, like shown here on the left, divides the community into different zoning districts. You've got residential, commercial, industrial, conservancy. And then on the right, along with each zoning district, is the text that describes the regulations, regulations that apply community-wide, as well as regulations that apply within a given zoning district. Um, general zoning is decided locally. So each community is different. Each community, it's the local elected officials with input from plan commission, zoning committee, um, advisory committees, they decide what the zoning says. That's true for general zoning as well as wellhead protection zoning. So for each zoning district, such as the residential district, there are three types of uses permitted uses, conditional uses, and prohibited uses. Permitted uses are allowed by right in all parts of that zoning district. There may be standards such as setbacks that apply. Conditional uses are sometimes um, allowed within an area. Um, the use has to be listed in, in the ordinance as a conditional use in order to be considered as such. And we do have a new law from 2017 that says if the applicant for a new development meets or agrees to meet the conditions in the ordinance and by the body deciding on conditional uses, then the local government shall grant the conditional use permit. So think carefully about what you list as a conditional use. If you think that a given land use is a poor idea in a given location, it's not a good idea to list it as a conditional use. Um, and then the last category are prohibited uses. These are uses that either aren't listed in the zoning ordinance at all, or they might be listed in the ordinance as prohibited. So they're not allowed within that zoning district. If we look at different land use impacts from different land uses, this is an example put together by Kevin Masaryk from our groundwater center here at UW-Stevens Point. Um, he looked at how much nitrogen and what the nitrate level would be um, comparing a cornfield on the left with a 20 acre parcel with one septic system on it on the right. Um, you can see that the contribution from the cornfield, the 20 acres is 16 parts per million nitrate, whereas the one septic system on 20 acres is less than one um, milligram per liter of nitrate. So a large difference. And we're gonna come back to this a little bit later, but I just wanna give you a diff an idea of the difference between loading in terms of nitrogen. So this points out the importance of how your zoning ordinance classifies land uses that are high nitrogen or otherwise have high potential for groundwater contamination. They could be listed as permitted, conditional, or prohibited. How are you going to list them in your ordinance? Um, we did a survey of six Central Sands counties and it looked at their ordinances in terms of how they classified them. The uses circled in red are all high nitrogen uses. Um, and you can see that things like fertilizer plants and feedlots 
were listed as conditional uses typically, which means that they could likely be approved if the if the applicant says they will meet the standards. And what are those standards? It depends on your local ordinance. Maybe you have clear standards and maybe you have very general standards that are hard to apply. Um, permitted uses that tend to be high nitrogen are ag uses and golf courses. Um, so you can see that in these ordinances, um, these high nitrogen uses are certainly allowed as conditional uses or as per, per hip, or as permitted uses. Um, we do have a few examples that we'll be showing you from other parts of the state where some of these uses are classified differently as prohibited or as conditional uses with strong standards. Um, a couple of other um, uses to keep in mind regarding groundwater protection are gas stations. Um, gas stations usually have underground tanks, large tanks with gasoline and diesel. If those leak, you could have groundwater issues as well. Same with chlorinated solvents. Um, so you want to review the permitted, conditional, and prohibited uses in your zoning districts and see if that matches up with what you want in terms of groundwater protection. Um, it's also a good idea to compare these zoning maps with groundwater susceptibility maps or soil maps. It's similar to what Jen showed a bit ago with the nitrogen leaching potential um, map there. Um, there are also, I believe it's USGS, um, might be Geological and Natural History Survey, um, has groundwater susceptibility maps that apply statewide. So you can certainly look up your county there. Um, so then the questions are, are potentially polluting uses being allowed in areas that are highly susceptible to groundwater contamination? And do the maps and the zoning text need to be updated to protect groundwater quality? Um, this zoning land use classification is key. Are you listing something as permitted, conditional, or prohibited? And this is an example table from a zoning ordinance that shows how different land uses might be listed. Um, so a livestock facility may be permitted in A1, conditional in A2, and then prohibited in the other zoning districts. Um, fertilizer plant, might be conditional in A1 and prohibited in the rest. I'm not saying these are the right answers. I'm just saying here's an example and you wanna think through these uses in your own ordinances. Similarly, gas stations are conditional only where they would be most needed um, and um, prohibited in other districts. Okay, and now a bit of a warning. <laughs> um, be prepared for new land uses. Um, we've seen a number of times when communities think, oh, that land use won't come to our community. We've never had it in the past. Um, it may or may not. Um, and planning ahead is really the only option um, for preventing these sorts of impacts on groundwater. Um, you want to think carefully about how you list land uses and make sure that you list all the possible land uses that you can think of, um, even if you've never seen them near your community yet. Um, you also want to use strong language and measurable standards. Um, one of the ways you can use strong language is if you don't think it's a good idea to have certain uses um, near municipal wells or maybe within your community as a whole, consider listing it as a prohibited use. Um, don't assume that new land uses won't come to your community. Um, these are all things that have happened in Wisconsin. Um, nuclear waste sites, pesticide manufacturers, confined animal feeding operations, large farms with confined animals, um, manure digesters, and PFAS sources. Um, when a developer submits their application for a project, at that point, it's too late to change your ordinance to include that use or strengthen the standards for that use. Once the application is submitted, what you had on the books at the time it was submitted is what applies. And even let's say you hear, you know, an application is coming a month from now. 
good luck revising your zoning ordinance in a month. It takes more than that just to go through the legal process. So don't think you can do it at the very last minute either is what I'm trying to say. Um, so a couple of examples that have been in the news recently. Um, down in Tennessee, there was a large Ford a manufacturing facility that was put on top of the wellhead protection area um, there, and they didn't have protection in place in that location. Um, another one that I hadn't thought of until it popped up in a news story is these artificial turf areas. Um, they're finding that the artificial turf, the little rubber beads, um, at least some of them contain PFAS. So something else to keep in mind. This was a story about a plan commission that turned down um, an artificial turf area because they didn't want PFAS in their wellhead protection area. Um, just an example, a fertilizer or pesticide storage facility, um, a way to be proactive would be to list it in the zoning ordinance, You know, list this land use um, with strong language. It might be prohibited. That's very clear and simple. Um, you don't need monitoring, or you don't need data. If it's prohibited in certain areas that are susceptible and have wells, that might be the simplest. Um, another option would be to allow it as a conditional use in strategic areas um, with lower groundwater susceptibility. Um, you would want defined conditions to both minimize spills and leaks, as well as those conditions transfer to future owners. So you would want secondary containment, you'd want regular monitoring for spills so that if a spill did happen, you found out about it sooner rather than later. And if the contaminant moves off site, you would want clarity on what is the funding and procedures for cleaning that up as soon as possible so it doesn't spread farther. Um, Reactive is the other option. Um, maybe this use isn't listed or there's very general standards for it. If leaks or spills occur and contamination travels off site, you're going to have to have discussions with the company throughout the process. One question is, does the company continue to spill or contaminate if they've got a leaking tank or they're spilling some chemical on the ground? Um, in this case, you're going to need data to prove what the source of the contamination is. And in order to get that data, lots of questions come up. Who can do a study? How much data is enough? Who pays for the study? The study would include a sampling plan, monitoring wells, sampling, data analysis, and then someone to interpret. What does that data say? Um, and then when the study is done, then either the local government or the residents or both have to decide what are they going to do? Okay, the study was done, but what are they going to do after the study is completed? How are they going to prevent further contamination and clean up what's there? Is that going to include enforcement? Is it going to go to court with lawsuits? Are they going to have to find funding for cleanup and cleanup and monitoring to make sure that it is cleaned up to a sufficient standard could take decades. Um, so this reactive approach, I would argue, takes more work, more time, more stress, more cost, and can have possible negative health impacts. Okay, now we're gonna talk about overlay zoning. The example we're using here is wellhead protection. You can see on the map that you've got, you know, your commercial, your residential, um, industrial uses, and then on top of this area of residential, you have wellhead protection. This is a second layer of protection um, meant specifically to protect the groundwater, the wellhead. Um, a little bit more of a schematic, if we've got our well here in the middle with the water tower, um, this land area with the semicircle, the dotted line, is the wellhead protection area. And you want to think about what sorts of uses do you have within that area and what are you going to keep outside? Are you going to keep agricultural chemicals outside? What about lawn fertilizers and pesticides? What about your wastewater treatment plant? underground storage tanks like gas stations, cemeteries, landfills, where are all these going to be located relative to your wellhead protection area? 
And now I hand it off. Oh, let me just mention on the webinar page that you were linked to, um, we have three example, examples of wellhead protection ordinances, the three listed here. Um, so you can take a look at those. All right. So from those of you who might be in attendance, you may have heard of wellhead protection um, before. Almost every municipal well in the state is required to have a wellhead protection plan, which identifies that protection area, um, but then also identifies potential threats to that source water as well. Now, a way to implement that plan or to put it in place is through an ordinance or that overlay zoning. There are numbers, uh, a number of cities or villages that have their own individual wellhead um, protection ordinances in place. And those ordinances extend to their municipal boundaries um, as far as regulating the land uses within the districts um, that they determine um, within that ordinance. The, I just saw a question pop up in the Q&A, what if that extends beyond? Um, and that's a great that's a great question. So I'm going to hold Portage County up as an example here. We have municipal wells in the village of Junction City, Plover, Whiting, at the city of Stevens Point, and the village of Amherst. Um, all of those, I think, have wellhead protection areas that extend beyond their municipal boundaries. So um, in the early 90s, Portage County had decided that it was important to protect these recharge areas even outside of the municipal boundaries and put in place a countywide um, wellhead protection ordinance. So what that ordinance does is it picks up the same overlay zoning um, outside of those municipal boundaries and the county is the one that enforces that in those rural areas. So we have a chance to protect larger um, protection areas uh, in that particular case. Now each of those municipalities have matching language within their ordinances so you're not getting conflicting ones when you cross a municipal boundary um, in those cases but that was done in coordination between all of those entities in the county. So what a wellhead protection ordinance really does is it you um, determine different areas of protection. In the case of Portage County, we have three different zones, zone A, zone B, and zone C. Those are based on the time of travel. So how long does it take groundwater to enter into the area and enter into the municipal well? Zone A for Portage County is the cone of depression. So that's the immediate drawdown area surrounding the well. And that varies on how much water uh, each municipal well is capable of pumping. Then zone B um, goes out to about, I think a five or 10 year time of travel. And then zone C stretches out to a 20 year time of travel. There is no set distinction on how many zones you can have or what dictates um, those different zones that's left up to the individual um, municipality. But again, the overarching theme here is to protect the health and well-being of the residents and the municipal drinking water sources. I will say that this particular wellhead protection ordinance is based solely on municipal wells. So your city well, that supplies municipal water to the people within the city of Stevens Point or the villages of Plover and Whiting. However, a wellhead protection ordinance can be used to protect any public drinking water source. So you can set up um, and regulate any public drinking water source with a wellhead protection ordinance the same way you would a municipal well. And by that, I mean there are different classifications of public drinking water sources. So you have your transient non-community drinking water sources, which are your restaurants, churches, bars that may lie in rural areas but serve different populations, schools, uh, mobile home parks. Um, there's also, there, I think there's five different classifications other than municipal, uh, non-transient, non-community, your transient community sources. And so this can be a much, much bigger um, ordinance and a much bigger tool to be able to use um, at your disposal. I have personally over ever seen this used um, for municipal wells, but Dave Johnson at the DNR will be the first one to tell you mm -mm, it can apply to any public drinking water source. 
The other thing is, is that while you're protecting municipal drinking water sources, you can see that these protect quite a ways out into more rural neighborhoods that are covered by private residential wells. So at the same time that you're protecting municipal wells, you're also protecting private wells um, in the same vein. So Lynn. So then within each district um, that a wellhead protection ordinance has, um, these talk about the delineations for the time of travel, but there are also associated land use practices within each of these zones, practices that are permitted, practices that are conditional use practices, and then practices that are prohibited. So District A, because it is the closest to the municipal well, will have the most restrictive practices. Um, in this case, these are oftentimes like parks uh, that are allowed. Um, green space is one that's commonly allowed. Residences that are sewered, so that are served by municipal water and sewer, they pose a low risk to groundwater. So those are often permitted in zone A. Um, but pretty restrictive uses. When you get out into zone C, you have a much, much larger list of things that are permitted, um, some that are conditional, and then your list of prohibited uses gets much smaller. Those are reserved for things like toxic waste disposal, um, you know, your fertilizer plants that are, pose a really potential high risk. And that's really what you're doing with this is you're evaluating different land use risk and based on the potential impact to the drinking water source, as well as how close it is. Um, um, to the drinking water source as well. So Lynn. Okay, so this is what I had just talked about. You can kind of see there, this is the village of Junction Cities. Um, you can see the different zone A, zone B, and zone C. Um, and then that there are different uses allowed in each of those zones as well. Okay, next slide. Um, Chippewa County is another great example of a county-wide wellhead protection ordinance, and I wanted to highlight this one because it is different than Portage County's. They only have two zones um, within their, their wellhead protection ordinance. You can see that the purpose and authority is pretty much the same. When it comes to tools to protect groundwater, um, Personally, I feel this is probably one of the strongest tools that we have at our availability. It's really backed by strong language in our state statute that really gives it a lot of credence um, in, in your ability to really regulate land uses you, through utilizing this tool. So you can see here, they have a zone one, which goes out to the 30 day time of travel. And then there's zone two, um, which it goes from the 30 day time of travel out to the five year time of travel. And so it really is dependent on what works for your community and what your specific needs are and what you feel is an appropriate level of restriction um, or you know, regulation within these land uses as well. So lots of availability or variability um, for communities to kind of tweak this and make it their own and make it something that really works for them. Okay. Okay, I'm going to touch a little bit here on general zoning. I'm keeping an eye on the time and I see we're at about 1250. So I'm just going to hit a few highlights here in general zoning. We'll touch quickly on subdivision um, ordinances and then we'll take your questions. So in general zoning, this covers the entire local government area. And I just want to point out the importance of location and what's up gradient. Um, we've got a river, probably a flowage here. This is residential development in orange and yellow. You can see they're small lots. Um, and then you have, this is an ag district here that's feeding groundwater toward it. So you have a couple of potential issues here. One is um, if this is not a sewered area, you've got small lots where septic systems could be impacting wells. Um, and then secondly, you may have fertilizer or other chemicals coming from ag into this residential area. So keeping those sorts of things in mind as you're dealing with your general zoning ordinance. We talked about this earlier. I'll just compare that in order to have similar amounts of nitrogen moving to groundwater, you would have about half acre lots on septic would be similar to a cornfield in terms of nitrogen loading. 
Um, I pointed out earlier that different crops leach different amounts of nitrogen um, to the groundwater. And you can see here that potato and sweet corn as well as field corn are right near the top in terms of leaching the most. Um, if we compare this corn and potato with the most nitrogen leaching, and then the other thing that contributes to nitrate leaching potential is the type of soil. The excessively drained, the sandier soils, that's where you're likely to have the most nitrate leaching. So it depends on both what crops are grown. At the low end, we've got forest, prairie, CRP, alfalfa, other legumes like peas and beans um, are gonna be at the low end and we've got corn and potato at the high end. Um, I wanna introduce this Burnett County example. Um, about 80% of Burnett County is less than 20 feet from the land surface to the water table, and they have highly permeable soils. That means contaminants that dissolve in water go down quickly. Um, that's shown by the bright orange here on this map that takes up a good share of the county. Um, and what they have in Burnett County is not much exclusive ag zoning in those sandy soil areas of the county, in the bright orange areas. Um, so what they've done in their zoning ordinance and their livestock siting ordinance is they've said exclusive ag zoning districts can have unlimited number of animal units per farm. In contrast to their other ag districts that are the ones that tend to be on the sandy soils, um, there they limit animal units to 500 per farm. They use their livestock siting ordinance, livestock facility license is needed for all facilities over 250 animal units. So you're, you're requiring a license for anything over 250 and you're capping it at 500 in all areas except exclusive ag. Um, they also increase the required manure storage so that they have more flexibility about when manure is applied. Um, so those are the different pieces. Now you'll notice these two yellow towns marked on the map. Um, this one is all high permeability, high groundwater susceptibility on the right. And this one has some medium permeability, so not so susceptible on the left. So this is Trade Lake um, that has, um, it's, whoops, it's less susceptible. Um, and if we look at exclusive egg where you can have the larger number of animals, you have some of that in Trade Lake. This is the less susceptible to groundwater contamination town. Remember Siren, town of Siren was all highly susceptible. And what you can see is the ag in town of Siren, the ag zoning district is almost all A2, meaning that you have limits on animal units per farm, that 500 animal units is the requirement there. So here's how they've played this out in their zoning. There are also land uses that protect groundwater. Um, this whole list of options, um, including solar, as well as grazing, forested areas, and prairies. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how solar might be used for groundwater protection. I'll also just note that I'm going to do another webinar. Um, this will be on large-scale solar projects. I believe it's the end of July. It's on the same webinar series. Um, so if you know the direction of groundwater flow, here it's shown as the blue arrow, so the groundwater flow is going this way, um, you can strategically locate solar developments, or at least try to encourage them in those locations. So if you've got a cluster of private wells here, maybe there are some groundwater quality issues, a solar project that's up gradient from that might protect, improve the water quality there because you have little to no fertilizer being applied and also limited pesticides. Um, another option is maybe you wanna put a new subdivision over here and you wanna make sure it's protected from potential impacts from upgrading it. 
So again, you might site a solar project to protect wells that would go in in this subdivision. So that's the idea. Um, keep in mind, for, in order to site solar, you're probably going to need large transmission lines. Here we happen to have one shown in purple along Highway 54, or a large energy user that's going to use the energy from that solar project. Um, and when you're, if you choose to pursue this, you want to look for solar developers who work at the scale that you have in mind. In Wisconsin, we have solar developers that work at the one to 20 acre scale. We also have solar developers that work at the thousand acre scale. So keep in mind what you're looking for. Um, some subdivision ordinances are another tool. They're separate from zoning. If you don't have zoning in your community, you can still have a subdivision ordinance. Um, in terms of unsewered residential development, the point is you want large enough lot sizes if you're unsewered to try to prevent um, contaminants from a from a leach aid area from getting into a private well here. Um, this is an example of a subdivision where it was wells were impacted by septic systems. They're small lot sizes. Um, and so one option is to have larger lot sizes if you're gonna have unsewered residential development, um, two acres or more to prevent nitrate and pharmaceuticals from going from septic systems into wells. Another approach, um, instead of these large residential lot sizes, um, which eat up a lot of farmland or forest land, um, an alternative is to guide new residential development to villages or hamlets that already have public water or sewer. So then you don't have the issue of septic systems impacting wells. And Jen, I'll hand this off to you. All right. So if you refer back to what Lynn had said when she was comparing the corn land use to the private septic system, it only takes about a half acre lot, um, you know, over an entire area to start equaling the same impacts from a private septic system as what we would see on an agricultural cornfield. Um, and, you know, a lot of older subdivisions get down even into that quarter acre. Um, so we can definitely see areas that have elevated nitrate. Um, so a couple of counties have gone the route of not only putting in kind of minimum lot sizes to address in subdivisions, so that two acre minimum to try and reduce impacts between septic systems so that there's enough attenuation um, within the natural soils but also to try and determine, are there adequate water supplies for private residential wells to be installed in newer subdivisions? Um, and the Calumet County and Portage County both have this as part of their subdivision ordinance um, within their county. And the way that they do that, um, Lynn, if you can go to the next slide, is um, so where there is no public water supply, for a lot that's being created, this is applies to both minor and major subdivisions. So even just a simple division of land, if a person wants to come in and split their property, if there's no public water supply facility um, in that area, the Portage County Planning and Zoning Department can require a water test to be completed on that piece of property in order to me or in order to determine if there's adequate or safe drinking water supply. So really, this is kind of a twofold thing. It's one to make sure that we're not encouraging development in areas that may not be able to support additional development with their water supplies, and then to also to protect people's health and well-being as well, so that they're not inadvertently building in these areas where they may not um, be aware of groundwater quality. <clears throat> so the county does have the ability to deny a subdivision of land based on this. That typically is not the case um, in Portage counties. Typically what happens is they'll review the water quality test, the surrounding land uses. Um, and then what they may do is if the water test comes back with an elevated say nitrate concentration, they will put language on the certified survey map that says that on such and such date, a water test was collected from this property and it did not meet the drinking water standard for nitrate. And really what that's doing is it's trying to make people aware before whoever might go out and purchase the land 
or use it for a different purpose. You know, say it's been used as hunting land, um, but somebody wants to build a home on it. It's a way to try to make people aware. Uh, Portage County was of the mindset that it didn't necessarily necessitate a denial of that division. There are lots of areas that have high nitrates and there are remediation efforts that can be put in place, such as a treatment system. Um, Calumet County has that built into their subdivision ordinance that if uh, their nitrate exceeds the drinking water standard, a reverse osmosis system has to be installed on that piece of property with the well. So they go a step further to require treatment. Um, but it's a different way to kind of look at where development is taking place and to try and make um, educated kind of uh, assumptions or to guidance for people where they're developing um, within the county, so. All right. Um, given the time, I'm going to just quickly click through this. Um, I would ask you, um, I think Becky will launch the poll, if you have any ideas about what you might do related to um, what you've learned today. If you could fill out this poll, and then we have one additional poll. And I think while you're doing that, Jen and I can work on some of the questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the land use tools that we are talking about today. Um, I'll start with the question, is there any evidence about how manure digesters affect groundwater? Um, I would just say two things. I'm not aware of studies showing groundwater quality in that area. Um, of a manure digester, but I would say that when we look at manure digesters in Wisconsin, we're talking lots of animals um, on typical 4,000 cows um, in order to make a digester feasible. So it's bringing a lot of manure to one area. Um, so this could increase chances for spills. Sometimes they're trucking it in and out. Um, and the other thing that we know is digesters break down um, the organic matter and therefore the nitrogen and the phosphorus when it comes out of the digester is more water soluble than it was when it went in. So it will move more with the water than it did initially. Jen, do you wanna maybe take a quick stab at that reverse osmosis question? Yep, I can do questions one and two real quick. So I was just gonna reply to Madeline in the, in the chat, but I'll do it, or Carrie. Uh, yes, reverse osmosis systems can re remove nitrates in homes with private wells up until a certain point. So beyond 30 milligrams per liter of nitrate concentration, those reverse osmosis systems lose their effectiveness to be able to treat uh, nitrate and bring it down below the drinking water standard. They're still treating nitrate, but they, they struggle to bring it down below 10 milligrams per liter. And so at a certain point, we just say, you know, uh, when you start getting above that 30 milligrams per liter, treatment really isn't a great option anymore. And you're really limited to drinking bottled water or well replacement um, at that point. Yes, the majority of PFAS exposure does come from outside of drinking water sources in some cases. For those communities that have really high PFAS levels, those percentages may be skewed uh, depending on people's own exposure to them but PFAS are in everything. <laughs> so, you know, carpets, carpet shedding, dust within your own home, clothes, you name it. Um, there's a lot of different sources of exposure. The key is to try and reduce the sources of exposure as, mu as much as possible. So if we can reduce exposure through drinking water, that's a great way for us to lower just that one more source um, of PFAS exposure, which is why we kind of talk about that one. All right. Um, and I noticed the question from Scott about study data to support the recommendation of a minimum two acre lot size for unsewered subdivisions. And yes, we have those studies. They came from our UWSP groundwater lab. Um, and I'll pull up the links to those and include those in a follow up email. Yes. Yeah, you can also Google them through the Center for Watershed Science and Education, too. There's a list of reports that they have online. But yes, that one, those are available. Um, 
There was also one about protection zone overlapping into neighboring town and counties. Um, like I said, you can work on, so if you're an individual village and you have either another town, um, you know, you can go through for counties who have countywide zoning. That's an option to do that as a special overlay district. You can work with your adjoining, and, you know, municipality to try and create something very similar. Across county lines, Lynn, I'm not familiar of anything crossing county lines um, at this point. Yes, I'm you? not either. I'm yeah. not either. I see another question from Madeline. You talked about chemicals and some ag contaminants. However, should pipelines and the potential to leak in the ground and contaminate groundwater be relevant as well? Yes. Um, so there are a couple of potential issues here. One is any sort of petroleum products that can leak, um, and that could be an issue. Um, the other is we have some evidence um, from the Madison area that sometimes sewers leak. Um, so keeping an eye on those and finding out if they're leaking as well is an issue. Um, yeah. Jen, did you have anything to add to that one? I don't think so. Okay. So. Um, I could add that um, some of these manure digesters in order to transport all the manure to the digesters are doing that via pipeline as well. Some are trucking and some are using pipelines that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I thank you very much for attending our session today and sticking with us a little over time. Um, if you have any questions, let me go back to the slide that has Jen and I's contact information on it. There are two emails. You're welcome to reach out to us. And I hope I might see some of you for some of the other webinars. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you.